without further ado, I would like to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Cynthia Gonzalez, known to her students at Dr. G. She is Regents teacher and associate professor in the School of Music at Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. Oral skills is Dr. G's favorite class to teach, and you can check out her title, The Listen Sing Method, Volume One, currently in Smart Music. Cynthia, thank you so much for being with us today. I'll let you take it away. Good morning, and I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you, Giovanna, and also to Smart Music for this invitation. I'll start by sharing my screen, and we can get started. Listen Sing, Oral Skills for K through 12, and over to the side is the image listen sing method i'll be talking some about what i have in listen sing but for starters let's think about what let's see there we go let's think about uh and i've already run into snafu number one there we go what oral skills what are they in that it's a common term here within music and music education. And yet there's not always a shared agreement as to what they are. If you took music theory and oral skills classes in college, then you probably remember it was sight singing, rhythmic dictation, melodic dictation, the dreaded harmonic dictation, and maybe a little bit of error detection. One of the definitions or des descriptions of oral skills that I like in particular is think in music, not think about music, but thinking in music. And so what does that include? A big component of that is audiation. Generally thinking in terms of, do you hear music in your head constantly or specifically when you are making music, when you're singing, when you're reading notation, when you're improvising, are you hearing the music in your head, even if you can't hear it out loud? So what are the oral skills that are needed in order to do all those things we do at the college level, such as the sight singing and the dictation and error detection? Well, first of all, you need to be able to audiate. Do you hear the music in your head, that, that inner ear? Pitch retention is huge. And that goes along with being able to match pitch. Pulse perception, can you keep a steady beat? Um, can, same different. If you hear two motives, do you discern that they're the same or, or not? Uh, or to what extent are they the same or not? And then a, a really basic one is higher or lower. Do you hear pitches as being fundamentally higher or lower? So that is some of what goes into oral skills. And so let's get busy in tab, command, that's not the one I want. There we go. Let's get into the Listen Sing volume one. And the first set of exercises in the volume are Echo Sing. And there are 26 Echo Sing exercises in volume one, set one. And then there's another set, an, another 26, A through Z. I had to stop at Z be, uh, at 26 because there's only 26 letters. So initially, if I'm trying to teach somebody how to match pitch occasionally, even though I'm at the college level, I do get a student who is really struggling to match pitch, primarily because they simply haven't used their voice much. They're phenomenal instrumentalists um, on their own instrument, but they haven't figured out how to use their voice. And so I will send them over to do some echo sing exercises. And since um, we're all muted, and so you're welcome to sing along at home. And of course, I know this is gonna be easy for you, but think about a student who um, has trouble using their singing voice.
Yes, nice way to warm up our voices this morning. So if we start off with some, some echo singing, right away we're focusing our students listening and asking them to respond back with their singing voice. These are wonderful warm-ups in class in that it focuses on what are you listening and then responding appropriately. If you are in the classroom where not everybody is um, at a computer workstation with the little headphones on interacting with smart music one-on-one, -on -one, which typically happens at the uh, in a rehearsal situation or at the higher levels, then um, you can have this already pulled up on a computer workstation in your classroom. Maybe it's connected to a speaker and students can um, hear it, but not see it on screen. In which case you can be doing the hand solfege the hand signs for the solfege. Um, students then can echo or can imitate your hand signs or they can just sing back on a neutral syllable. But to get them focused in on listening and providing a physical response, that will develop audiation skills. Now, if you are not in a classroom, but you're doing private lessons one-on-one, -on -one, this is another great way to start. If you are a clarinet teacher, and you give them a concert and say the, the initial pitch is going to be a concert G. And after you hear the first measure on your instrument, play back what you are hearing. That is actually um, sort of like melodic dictation, but without writing it down, that's giving a musical response through an instrument to, uh, to what they are hearing. And that the ability to echo back what you are hearing is fundamental to that very higher level skill of melodic dictation. So if you are providing students with an echo sing opportunity, whether it's K through 12 at any grade level, you are preparing them to think in music and you're preparing them to listen critically such that if they are, uh, if they do choose to be a college level music major, then they are prepared um, to take melodic dictation because that any of those dictation skills are really quite higher level. So what else can you do with an echo sing? Well, if you're in say a junior high choir situation and you have smart music displaying on your screen, then um, you can have individuals respond. They listen to a measure and then they take turns. You can definitely have them respond back with hand signs. Um, if you are preparing them to go to contest where I don't know about other states, but in the state of Texas, there's very clear rules about what you're allowed to do um, and say and sing or not sing inside the sight reading contest room. And uh, oftentimes the choirs in a first read through of the choir piece there to sight read uh, will, will chant the, the solfege syllables and they will work the hand signs because the, the assumption is that if they're doing the hand signs then they are hearing it in their head. So this is a, another great way to start off a choir rehearsal where the students are echoing and doing the hand signs or make it purely an oral skills activity and the students don't see at all what you're seeing on the screen right now. They hear it and then when they go to sing it back, they sing it back with the solfege and the high and the hand signs. And that is very high level because to take it from hearing it once to immediately putting it on solfege and hand signs, that means that they have critically listened and then connected what they are hearing to sounds that they already have labeled and memorized and they've put into their musical database that is ingrained in their memory, in their hard drive, so to speak. So lots of different ways to use echo singing, even whether you're in a class, whether students can see the screen or not, and individually. And I'm sure that by giving you just a few suggestions, you can think of other ways to use echo singing. For example, um, maybe you have a, a, an upper level course and the students are very proficient in reading. And instead of turning on the, um, 
actually turning on the exercise, you display this on screen, give them a starting pitch and flip it around. One of your students sings measure, the first notated measure and um, then the class sings the second measure. Or there's a different ways of, of uh, other ways of using this again. Um, so, or you have one student come up to the workstation and, and read what's on, on screen that only they can see and the rest of the class echo sings. So lots of different ways. Um, let me show you some of the other echo singing. Um, let's see, this one. Oh, okay. So this is letter N still within set one. So we want to, to we've, we've echo, we, we've, we've performed this one. And um, now, so let's go ahead and, and just sing through this one. And maybe we'll up the tempo a little bit here which is easy enough to do over in the upper left hand of the screen. Okay. Do ti la so, so la ti do. Okay, so we have now sight read it, uh, or sorry, done the echo seeing aspect of it. If it's actually on screen, then students are connecting what they are hearing along with how it's notated, and then uh, the labels we give to it if we're using movable dough solfege. We always want to think in terms of making those connections between what we're hearing, the label system we use, and then what it looks like on the staff. Now, Let's see, what else can I do with this? Well, let's say that we call this one, two, three, four. Now, if I could actually see you, I would say, put onto your fingers, one, two, three, or four, which one am I about to perform? Do, 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 do. Which one was that? Was that the first one? Was that the second one? Was that the third one or was that the fourth one? And of course, I really hope that you put two fingers on your hands. Okay, um, this is discerning and making the difference between or detecting the difference between what am I hearing and how does it relate to what I see on the screen? Now, these are all four very different. I guess you could say that the last one, measure four and measure one, are close because it, they both start off with descending steps. But when you look at the end, number four ends with the same pitches at the very end in place three and four, whereas the first one is totally descending by four different pitches. But that's another way you can sort of gamify um, listening and creating oral skills because if students can discern which one of four on that system that you, you are performing, then they're doing some pretty good um, connections between what they're hearing and what they're seeing notated. And this is another opportunity for um, in a classroom to say, okay, um, volunteers who is willing to sing alone as a solo, one of these four and everybody else will figure out which one you did or will decide which one you did. And of course, you can, you can also uh, incorporate echo singing if one student chooses to sing the third one. Do, do, me, me. And of course, they need to sing it not on solfege, just on a neutral syllable like lu, 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 lu. And then everybody else in the room echoes that, hopefully on solfege and, and with hand signs. And then um, they, that shows that they're listening, making those connections between what they're hearing and label system and what looks like on the page. So there's wonderful opportunities for using these echo sing exercises 
um, as, as a, a, a genuine echo sing, but then extending it further into building oral skills and also connected with that is music literacy. Now let's go on to these exercises that are called sing tonic. This incorporates those fundamental skills of audiation, the singing in your head, and also pitch retention. So sing along. Okay, so I guess I could have been singing on Do the whole time and notice that this one was in the bass clef. It really doesn't matter um, because it's not assessing me, but this is also a way for students to get used to the idea that Do can be on any line or space. Um, and we could easily switch this to a treble clef. And then we also have tenor voice, which is literally the treble clef with the octave difference for tenors. Now, this ability to hold on to tonic is one of our fundamental oral skills, especially um, in sight reading, that, that ability to wherever tonic is, you can just get right back to it. It's home plate and it's often, it will be, we actually coach students that on one track in that big soundboard in your head, you are constantly hearing the tonic pitch of dough or one if you use numbers. So this uh, helps to build that skill because as you heard where it says here tonic, uh, oh, sorry, where it was a rest, it was sometimes tonic, but sometimes not tonic, um, a non-tonic detractor pitch. So the students had to keep singing in their ear, in their, in their mind, they had to keep audiating tonic, even if another pitch was being performed. So um, this, I have 12 of these exercises. And since you're a music educator and, oh, where'd they go? Here we go, sing tonic. Let's go to number six. So you've probably taken these classes where we ask you to do these sorts of skills. Uh, and so here's one that's a little bit more difficult for you. was still probably well within your range. I should also say that sometimes um, I will assign these to my students with the metronome going because uh, I have found that when it, this is actually being assessed and you get the score and um, possibly green notes, red notes, yellow notes in response to the accuracy of the rhythmic placement and the pitch placement, um, I find that it's easier for students if I've had the metronome on. And of course, not all of these are in the key of G. Let's go to one that I hope is not in the key of G. And number nine gets a little bit more difficult. Yeah, this is not in the key of G. And of course, if you are dealing with students who have perfect pitch, this is not going to be a big challenge for them because they'll simply look at, oh, that's an E flat notated and be able to pull the E flat from their uh, perfect pitch brain. Um, but most of us are working hard to hold on to Do through the detractor pitches. I'm gonna 
to not have that volume be too loud there. <laughs> Yes, it is quite something to at the very end have a 1571 when you've been hearing all these detractor pitches that had nothing to do with 1571. Um, so this is particularly excellent for building audiation and pitch retention, which are fundamental oral skills if you advance to the higher level um, skills. But even for young singers or young instrumentalists, young musicians, young listeners, these are fundamental skills that will increase their listening abilities, increase their musicianship skills. Now, how can you use this if um, you're in a different kind of classroom or, or, or you're, the students, okay, they've got sing tonic. They've done through number 12. They are great. They can hear anything and still audiate when they're hearing detractor pitches. They've still got tonic in their head. Well, here's an example. Give them one that um, is maybe this number nine and give them as a homework or work it out in, in class as in group. Uh, then ask them to sing one of the pitches that they're hearing in one of the measures where they have a rest. So let's get, let's see if I press the cursor here. Let's just hear measure five. Well, let's, let's, um, we need to hear tonic, but I'll stop it at measure five. <laughs> What did you hear in there? If that's do, let's see if we can play just measure five again. I hear that pitch. If this is do, what is this? Do, re, mi, fa, so. I heard so in there. Now that's pretty advanced. That might be, um, you know, a high school level student or a fantastic junior high or that really awesome elementary school student who always pushes the envelope on all of these because that is definitely leading toward, oh, I, I just have one reference pitch and it's, it, and what I'm hearing might not really fall into um, tonal music, what I've heard before. So that's another way of really pushing the envelope with these sing tonics. And in all of the exercises within the listen sing method volume one, you can use them in a multiplicity of ways. And that's, that was by design. Okay, pentascales. Well, penta meaning five. So this is not the pentatonic scale, that's something else. And of course, this is not pentatonics. That's that amazing, awesome, awesome uh, vocal ensemble, just pentascales. And at the collegiate level, when I'm teaching oral one, I require pretty near the beginning of the semester, I don't introduce it on day one, but soon thereafter, that I expect my students to sing pentascales. We, of course, do this first on solfege. But right away, we move into singing pentascales on letter names. And I will give this to them within Smart Music as an assignment. Where And so they're just reading the letter names right off the staff. C, D, F, G, F, E, D, C, G, E, major chord. And we're moving counterclockwise around the circle of fifths. So E natural leads to F. And we move right along the circle of fifths counterclockwise because C, of course, is the dominant of F. And then F is the dominant of B flat. The third of B flat becomes the leading tone to E flat. So I have some real um, ulterior motivations when I'm assigning this to freshmen in oral skills 
first of all, I want them to learn the first five notes of every major scale. And then at the very end of this pattern, I tack on the, the triad, C, G, E, major chord. And what I have found is that I don't really have to spend much time teaching them how to spell chords because by the time they've done four pentascale exercises, C to C sharp, or uh, sorry, this, this one is down by, um, is moving through the flat side. So we get to C and get to D flat. We start on C, get to D flat. And then there's another one with through the major uh, chords, major pentascales. We start on C sharp and get our, all the way back to C. And then we do the same thing with minors, but in minors, we start with C and stop at A flat since we don't really need D flat minor. And then we start over with G sharp minor and work our way back to C minor. By the time they finished singing all of these pentascales, and then I ask them to totally memorize it. And they have to also then uh, play the five note scales at the piano. And it's the same fingering pattern, regardless of what the starting pitch is. They have pretty much internalized the first four, the first five notes, first four notes also, but the first five notes of every major and minor scale. And they've learned how to spell pretty much every major and minor scale, the major and minor triad. And therefore, in, on the written theory side of things, when we go to understanding, well, how is that major triad constructed? They already have a repertoire of major and minor scales with which to, uh, to reference when we go to explaining some of the labeling of intervals that they've already learned how to sing. And of course, it's always please sing first and then move to labels. So this is one of the exercises that I very much um, rely on at the beginning of oral skills when they when they arrive in first semester um, oral skills and we do this in smart music first and then we advance to it being memorized and they're at the keyboard uh, singing and playing so that we're engaging multiple multiple um, of the of the uh, their senses it's the physical sense and then it's the singing and the listening so Okay, so if you're sitting there saying, okay, I'm an elementary music teacher, really? Do I need my students to do all of this? No, no. But what happens if you're trying to introduce maybe the key of D major? Like, yes. And you're trying to teach them to read D major in the treble clef. And I have set this up as a loop, love loops. So I pressed loop at the very top and then set. And when I press set, it gives me some markers to move around and it's gonna constantly repeat those four measures. What happens if I wanted just to repeat those two measures? Uh, I don't wanna use a count off between loops because I just want those loops to go around and round. All right. Um, oh, and I forgot to tell you, I use sh at the end of letter names. Uh, I use a lot of solfege on uh, a lot of singing on solfege because vocalists know solfege forwards and backwards with all the signs. It's really impressive. Instrumentalists, not so much with the solfege, depends on, um, of course, their background. Instrumentalists usually talk in terms of letter names. And so they arrive at college knowing letter names pretty well, but not solfege. And the vocalists tend to know solfege, but not letter names as well. And so in class, I'm constantly going back and forth between the two so that everybody becomes very fluent in both. Uh, and and uh, letters and numbers, uh, whatever system you're using, I totally recommend becoming fluent in some set system such as numbers or solfege and then letter names as, as well. So, um, and so in order not to have to put eighth notes on beat three um, and singing F sharp, I just put a sh at the end of the F letter. D, E, F, G, A, G, F, 
happy. And at the beginning of the semester, the most of the kids kind of look at me like, okay, this woman really is weird. Everything that people told me about her uh, was so true. She's so weird. And then a couple of weeks into it, they're doing it also. And they just laugh at themselves and it's great. And so with flat letter names, I put at the end. So for example, beef, C, D, E, F, F, E, F, D, C, beef. And of course, then we have some jokes about where's the beef um, from that old Wendy's TV commercial. Uh, because somehow the students know that, that uh, little question, where's the beef? So this is an opportunity to practice sight reading in, or sorry, to practice reading in a particular cleft in with the letter names. And if I wanted to practice bass clef singing, I can do the same thing. And let's see, this was starting at C sharp and going over to C, um, putting all those sharps, maybe not necessary, uh, but let's, oh, so we've, we were practicing D in treble clef. Now let's come practice D in bass clef. Uh, set. There we go. There's now let's practice D in bass clef. And maybe this can turn into a lesson on, oh, if we're doing treble clef, uh, notice that treble clef D when, where we were singing before that was on a space. And then E was on a line. F sharp was also in a space. And here we've switched out line, space, line. You can talk about octave differences, that notes that are an octave apart, a letter name pitches that are an octave apart. One will be on a line, an octave away is, on a, a, is in a space. So this can get into all sorts of music literacy um, uh, uh, lessons. And could have also set this loop to reinforce singing and spelling D major chords. So lots of opportunities here uh, connected with music reading and also connected with um, learning to think in a key. Think in music is one of my catchphrases because that's the sound, the actively thinking in sound. But I also talk about thinking in a key. Um, when I say to my students D major, uh, I ask, okay, do you immediately see a D major scale with an F sharp and a C sharp as the leading tone? Uh, so thinking in a key, and if I'm asking kids to think in a key and it's D major, then I don't want them to say D F A because that's not going to cut it. <laughs> um, it always takes a, a couple of classes when students will know that they've said the right uh, letter names, but without the right accidentals. And I'll say, no, that's wrong. And they'll just look very puzzled until they realize, oh, D F sharp A. And it usually just takes a couple of times of making that mistake. And, and uh, we all learn from it. Now, if you have memorized, ask students to say, learn and from memory, um, some pentascales or this whole pentascale pattern. Personally, I would, I always start it on solfege. So, do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do, mi, so, mi, major chord. And yes, when we, if you go to the minor pentascales, that is adjusted to minor chord. Um, then I like to give a composition exercise and write a five note motive. I give them the rhythm, one, two, three, and four. Start and end on do and include do, re, mi, fa, or so. And other than do, try to use each tone only once. Now that's five articulations. Um, and we've got five solfege syllables. And I've said, try not to repeat them. Well, that's a kind of a hard, because we don't just want do, re, mi, fa, so. Okay. Um, but what I don't want is for them to use do, re, 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 do. So to use some variety. And I have done this with my college kids. And for them, it's like, oh, oh my gosh, that's way too simple. But this can be a way into composing, but with a real limited uh, rule, so to speak, for composing. And then I turn around. And, and so I collect those. And I say, you know, write 
five of them and they notate them out and they turn them into me. I put them into a music processor and that becomes our sight reading the next class time. And it's what they have composed. And of course, what they compose is sometimes harder than what I would compose for them, but it's also very, very limited. And the next time um, I might give them a more complicated rhythm or say, make it over two measures and this is the rhythmic profile. Or I might say some combination of trouble of, of quarter notes and eighth notes. Um, and my only stipulation is that you have to start and end on a quarter note because we don't really want to end on eighth notes. That gets a little bit tricky with breathing and moving forward and, and always oh, sounds just a tiny bit odd for the last note to be on the last eighth note of a measure. Uh, not very common in, in compositions. So um, this is uh, the music processor called Compose that is within Smart Music. If you go to the far right grid and you'll find that it's at the bottom left. Um, and so I set this up and so let's see, I'm putting in the key of G so I can... writing here and then I need eighth notes and that note is still lit highlighted and so I need to and then go back and make it an eighth note so now I'm in an eighth note oops I did this wrong I need that to be an eighth note sorry okay now I've got that and I need that to be an eighth note and now my next note, oh, and I want that to be a raise. That and then, yeah, I don't recommend that you let students do this. There we go. There's my one, two, three, and four. And do, so, mi, re, do. And if they are very fluent in that pentascale, then ideally they have the complete pentascale or at least do sounding in their head and pretty much they can then get into reading they compose a motive and then share it and read it with one another so um, this is one way once they have a specific um, known musical structure known musical structure that they have totally internalized and can sing accurately upon upon request on recall, then turn around and do compositions with it. Because that gets them into being a little bit, being creative for one thing and opening the door, shattering the, the myth of composer, getting them right into composing on their own. Now- Cynthia. Yes. Thank you for all of the wonderful information that you've shared so far. We're getting to uh, 45 minutes after the hour, and I want to take an opportunity to ask uh, three of the questions that have been posted in the Q&A section. Yes. So um, somebody asked, what is the best way to begin teaching oral skills in a middle school setting? We have two other questions after that. So if you can give a, a brief answer to that, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, middle school, is this a general music class or is this specifically... Um, a, a beginning orchestra, a band, or choir, I would start with listening. I would start with echo singing or echo clapping um, because that focuses their attention. That focuses, what are you hearing? Can I reproduce that? And you can do some of the sing tonic exercises, the one, not like number nine, but some of the ones at the beginning, number one through three, four. Um, asking them, uh, or at, giving them like a motive. You sing two motives. Do, 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 do. Same, different. You know, in these days of teaching through through Zoom, um, we've, we've learned to use hand signs again. And so same, different. And you sing two motives. If they can hear same, different, that means that they are listening critically. And that will go over to, if they're learning to read music, that ability to, oh, uh, listen critically. Um, did I play what my teacher played? Did I play it exactly the same way? Um, listening critically goes much further. When students sight read, can they discern that, yes, for sure, I sang what was notated on the page. Uh, no, I didn't. 
So that ability to listen critically, if you, you can start that with um, same different or sing a pitch. Doo, is my next pitch higher or lower? Doo, higher. Doo, my next pitch higher or lower? Doo. Let them respond to what you are doing. And then let one of them come up and take that role of leadership. Um, everybody sing the given pitch. Doo, is the next pitch they hear higher or lower? And I'm a little bit sad to say you'd be surprised, um, sadly, that I, I get kids as first semester oral skill students, that they can't always discern that. And that means that they're not audiating. They're not singing it in their head, because generally, if they are allowed to sing it in their head, or even better, if they sing it out loud, then they can discern, oh, yeah, was that higher or lower? But um, so one of the things that I, that if they're not already able to audiate, one of the things that I do is I'll sing a pitch and then I'll say, sing that back. Okay, Ooh, that's the reference pitch. Is this note higher on, on hum? Mm -hmm. Now tell me, oh, that was higher if I let them sing it. So starting off with oral skills can be as simple as echo singing, um, discerning higher, lower, same and different. I hope that helps. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Here's another question. Is there a way to do it in fixed dough? Um, you can use fixed dough anytime. Fixed dough is essentially letter names. But m the exercises that we have published in Smart Music, those are in movable dough. Um, you can, uh, you're, you, you can s always use fixed dough. Uh, but if you're going to display what uh, is already published within the listen sing method that's going to be in movable dough um, fixed dough is amazing because the students that i've worked with that learned uh, fixed dough um, for example students that come from mexico their sight singing ability is is amazing uh, they can sight read tone rows because they have so associated a specific sound with solfege um, and but they've tended to uh, have started fixed dough at a very, very young age, and it's been consistent. And they don't refer to letter names. If they're referring to some kind of E, they say me. If they're refer re referring to some kind of A, it's la. And so that fixed dough, um, I'm amazed with it when students who have been using it as a lifelong uh, way to name pitches as well as to sing pitches. Yeah. All right, one, we have one more question, if you can answer it in one minute. Uh, how do we continue using oral skills in lessons and rehearsing? Yes, well, I hope that um, some of you, you got some great ideas from some of what I did earlier in the class, because I, I did see that this is one of the questions posted before the session even started. And absolutely, if you are an instrumental um, uh, conductor, if you will sing with your students, some of the best band directors that I've had an opportunity to work with through Smart Music. When I ask, you know, what do you do in your rehearsals that, that allows your students to be so musical when they play and to play so in tune, it often comes down to, we sing as much as we can. If it's a line that can be sung um, as well as played on their instruments, we sing it. So absolutely, you can take this into um, a rehearsal and that echo singing, if they're not, seeing what's on the screen and therefore reading it if they hear it and then they have to play it on their instruments um or in that uh the sing tonic where they hear a cl cluster of notes and can they play one of the pitches that they're hearing in that cluster all right that's wonderful thank you cynthia for joining us and bringing us your experience today thank you so much thank you cynthia thank you everyone